One of the most famous and influential reggae instrumentals ever is the Sleng Tang rhythm. Originally released in 1985 on King Jammy's label, it's been revoiced over 450 times, more than any other rhythm, and it sparked the beginning of the digital era in reggae music, and in doing so paved the way for dancehall. The first vocalist on the rhythm was Wayne Smith. It was Smith's friend, Noel Davey, that had made the rhythm using a Casio keyboard. The keyboard was given to him by one of the members of the group, the Wailing Souls. You have a group called the Wailing Souls. You have a member, um, Gotti, he went, um, he went overseas and a bird named Bunny send the Cassio for me because he came to Jamaica and saw me. The, the whole time when I used to be down the Waterhouse playing music with, um, the, you know, Melodica, the little one they blow, that's what I had. And he said, you know, you're a talented youth and I'm going to get have a, have a organ at home and I'm going to send it for you. And so he did, he went to California and he sent the little Cassio. And this was like a big break for me because the, the, the Casio is a machine that I can use with current and battery, whereas the other one I had to blow it. So, you know, it was easier for me now. So that's how, when I got that Casio, other things started to happen. And right away I started to make different sounds and, you know, it was a difference to play something without you having to blow it. You just press it and it plays, you know. There was when Wayne touched something and I, his, uh, Wayne had something to do with it, he touched something and he jumped out. And I said, hear that, you know, and we, we both said, hear that. But when days gone by and we lost it, and I went back and find it because Wayne couldn't find, him, he, he didn't know how to produce, reproduce that sound again. But I, I take the machine and go through to his mind and I never stopped until I found it back. Like another week later, we found, found it back. And I told him that I found back and then I realized I can stop it and start it. I realized how it really worked. So then that's when he decided to let us take it to Jamis. And I followed him and take it to Jamis. So it go. I was in London at the time and you know they told me that they had this rhythm. My wife called me and said, Boy, I didn't have a bad rhythm here, but they lost it. So I flew in like a couple of days later and um, we found back the beat and then we add the rest of the music to it and it was too fast. So I used the tempo to slow it down, okay. ease it down a little and okay. then the dub and overdub what's there. I, I personally play the percussion and the syndrome and the clap pop pop and the, you know. We went straight in the studio and just laid down the rhythm. <laughs> When I recorded on the Muslim thing, that was the first track that was recorded. I sent it out on the sound system. It was tore apart with that rhythm. And I said, you know what? We have to start mixing some of the tracks on it now and put it on the street. Because the sound system was like my radio station. That's what I used to use to promote my records. Before, you know, anybody even hear, I sent it to the dance. And then it shows me how the people react to it. So I knew that this song or these songs needed to go out there and release and you know we had a dance the following week with Black Scorpio when I drew that rhythm in the dance that night he had to lock off his sound because nobody wanted to hear any other rhythm <laughs> you know and I have loads of artists on that rhythm one of the other artists Jammy recorded on the rhythm was Tenosaur oh, what the wop, oh, wop, oh, in Delhi. That song was done as a special on the Friday. The Friday, um, Sugar Miner took Tenasaw to the studio. They were going to country to play for a song. So they were doing it as a special. So when I did it now, I said, you know what? This tune here, wicked, and I should catch it on a cassette. So I put in the cassette and recorded the special, you know? So when I recorded a special, I called Tenasaw after and I said, Tenasaw, you can come back tomorrow and do the song for me. I love the song, you know. You know, he said, yeah, but we need some money, you know. So I gave him eight grand, you know. <laughs> yeah, so he went to country and he came back the Saturday, was to do the recording, but he couldn't sing it like how he sang it on, on the, the day before. So I played back the cassette for him. I said, you know what happened? I will use the Scott. And I just put it back to eight track and EQ it up and 
then, you know, that was the release, the cassette. Countless other iconic reggae artists have also voiced the rhythm. Yellow Man, Super Cat, Ninja Man, just to name a few. Although there'd been a few other digital bass rhythms before Sleng Ting, none had the impact of this track in its versions. It was a fresh new sound that for some was a welcome break from the traditional reggae rhythms that were starting to feel overused. It also established a trend for much simpler chord progressions and grooves that suited the toasting style of vocals that was gaining popularity. It was also much cheaper to produce recordings this way than using a full band. Sleng Teng was the rhythm that changed everything. And it all started with an accidental discovery. The sound that Noel Davey stumbled across that day was the rock preset, one of the preset drum beat and bass line patterns pre-programmed into the machine. The preset was composed by a Casio employee, Hiroko Okuda, who had just graduated Tokyo College of Music in 1980 and began working at Casio. For the previous 30 years, the company had only made calculators, cash registers and wristwatches, but they'd recently launched their first musical instrument, the Casio Tone 201. One of Okuda's tasks was to create presets for the keyboards including the Casio Tone MT40. She has never publicly revealed what song she based it on. Many have speculated that it was guitar playing rock and roll icon, Eddie Cochran, that inspired the riff, specifically his song, Something Else. Okuda was interviewed sometime in the 1990s and was puzzled by this rumor, as she'd never heard of the Eddie Cochran song and stated that she'd been inspired by something else. She did give another clue, it was a 70s British rock star, and if you heard the song, it would be instantly recognisable, she said. Interestingly, many of the reviews of Hang On To Yourself note that Mick Ronson's guitar playing is reminiscent of Cochrane. One reviewer described it as space-aged Eddie Cochrane. So although Akuda may not have known the Cochrane tune, Bowie certainly did. So in emulating his song, she has also captured something of the spirit of Eddie Cochrane. Hiroko Akuda said she had listened to reggae a lot growing up, so was happy that her work had played a part in the genre. But what would David Bowie think of being part of the evolution of reggae? When I was growing up, um, I lived in Brixton and what we heard a lot of there was Scar. Um, which was sort of, I suppose, the progenitor of reggae. It was ska first, and then it became blue beat, and then it ended up as reggae. So I have a certain affinity to it, with it, rather. Um, I like it, yes, it hasn't influenced much of what I've done, I must admit. <laughs> 